if you have been following along with us over the last couple of weeks, we have uh, been looking at those passages in Scripture that have typically been considered outside the normal Christmas story that we hear each year. These are not what you would usually find in a series of sermons about Christmas. But the point is to focus our attention on how we should live not just during Christmas or next Christmas season or the Christmas season after that, but each day of our walk with Christ. The point is we should be wholly focused on Christ and our relationship with Him. And we've seen that in the interaction between Mary and Elizabeth and then Mary's song of praise. And we will uh, see another aspect of that this morning as we uh, are actually going to be in Luke chapter 2. So as we wrap up this series on what I've called Christmas Outsiders, I want us to think about something. What have we learned out of the last two Sundays? We've learned that we are to take every opportunity we are given to share with others about what the Lord's done in our lives. And then we're to rejoice over what he's done in the lives of others as they share a testimony about how God has worked in their lives over the past year. And we saw this when Mary and Elizabeth spoke after Gabriel met with Mary in Luke chapter 1. Then last week we learned how we're supposed to minimize ourselves in our worship of the Lord and we're to lift him up high because that's where he deserves to be. And we see this as Mary sings a song of praise. She refers to the Lord showing favor on her in her humble condition. Then the rest of us talking about how magnificent the Lord is by what he has done. So we're supposed to live a life of humility in light of a world that preaches anything but humility. It is to live in a way that is counter-cultural to the world around us. Because we're focused on Christ as Lord, not us. So this week I want us to focus on two more things. Number one... That God is a promise-keeping God. And two, that He is a God that saves. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. You're thinking, Luke chapter 2, wait a minute, this is Jesus' birth. That's true. Hey, the shepherds are in Luke chapter 2. Yep, they're there. We're going after that. So if you would, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 2 once again, starting in verse 25. I'll read through verse 33. And as we look at this interaction between Mary, Joseph, a baby Jesus, and a man named Simeon. We get to look and learn about our attitude towards God. So if you have your place, if you would stand out of the reverence of the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 25. Let's back up a couple of verses so you kind of understand where we're at in the story here. I'm going to back up to verse 21. When the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived. 
And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So we have Mary, Joseph, and Jesus at the temple for Jesus to be circumcised and be dedicated to the Lord. This is what God has used to put them in the temple so this man named Simeon would be in the right place at the right time. God's made a promise. And we'll see how he keeps it. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple complex. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Verses 21 through 24. Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Thank you. You may be seated. Father in heaven, Lord, we just come to you again this morning. I'm thankful to be in your house. Thankful for the opportunity as a family of faith, to lift our voice in praise to you. Father, I pray that you will open our hearts, Lord, that you will prepare our ears to hear what you have to say through this message this morning. Father, I pray that one, it's an encouragement to all of us here, and two, it's a reminder, Lord, of why you sent your son Jesus. Father, I pray the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart are acceptable in your sight. You are our God, our rock, our strength, our redeemer. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. The church together said, Amen. Amen. So two points. First, God is a promise keeping God. Now, it's one thing to say that somebody is a promise maker. I can make promises all day long, but I don't carry them out sometimes. I have the best of intentions, but I don't do so well at times. But God is a promise keeping God. Now, just uh, by way of a little bit more background, Mary and Joseph go to the temple in Jerusalem because the law of Moses said they had to. She had to go through purification. The child had to go through purification. Because he was a male, he was supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day in order to be a good Jew. So Mary and Joseph take a baby Jesus to the temple to do what is expected of them as good Jewish parents. The reason behind this is because the, these ceremonies were intended to be a reminder of the imperfection and sin inherited by every human being. It was a reminder that there had to be a purification and that he had to be dedicated, offered to the Lord because he was the firstborn son. Now, Simeon was a man who the Bible describes as a righteous and a devout man. He was a good Jew. He uh, by most scholars, he was a priest. So he knew the prophecies of the Messiah. He knew what the Bible that they had at the time said about the coming Savior of the world. And God promised him, you're not going to die until you see your Messiah. Now it's one thing for God to go, you ain't going to die before you see him. 
and not carry through. But God carried through what he promised. Because the Spirit of God put Simeon in the temple the same time Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus were in the temple. So that Simeon would see his Messiah. God made a promise. He kept the promise. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if God were to come to me and say, you're not going to die until you see your Messiah face to face, that's a, that's a promise. Wouldn't you say? That's a promise. And that's a promise. I would wake up every day going, is it going to be today? Is it going to be today? Do I get to see him today, Lord? I haven't seen him yet, maybe tomorrow. But God made this promise. And, and that's why the Bible says he was looking forward to Israel's consolation. That was a, a phrase they used that, that they were actively praying for and looking for the promised Messiah to come. He was waking up every day expecting of seeing his Messiah. He was waking up every day looking. Because God made a promise. And he knew God was a promise keeping God. Because he knew the Old Testament. He knew all the things that God had done for his people of Israel all throughout the years. And he knew that when God said he was going to do something, he did it. So the Spirit of God brought him to the temple. And Simeon sees his Messiah. Now, I want you to imagine just for a second. Use your sanctified imagination to picture this. The Spirit of God moves and brings Simeon into the temple. He's looking around because he knows his Messiah is there somewhere. He's looking. The Spirit of God is still directing, still directing, and he sees Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Can you imagine the excitement? Can you imagine the joy that erupted out of his heart? That what he had been looking for for so long Seeing what God has said, you're going to see. How would you react? How would you react? Would you just kind of brush it off and go, keep kidding? How would you react? As I close my eyes and I picture what Simeon must have thought and what he, how he must have acted, I, I close my eyes and I picture this old man running, shouting praises to the Lord because his promise he has kept. And there is his Messiah. And he snatches this baby out of his mother's arms and he holds him up and he's like, He's here! My Messiah. He's here. That's why he starts off and saying, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace. Just as you have promised. I've seen him. My eyes have seen him. My hands have held him. Oh, dear Lord, you have promised, you have kept, and there he is. You've made a promise and you've kept it. How can God make a promise and us be certain that he will keep it? 
His knowledge and His power are infinite. He knows what will happen in the future. And He can make a promise now. Because He can look down 10, 20, 500 years down the road and go, it's going to happen here. So I'm telling you now what's going to happen. This is my promise. There's no telling how long it's been since God had told Simeon that you're not going to die until you see your Messiah. Because God has an infinite source of power, He can make sure whatever He says will happen, will happen. That's how God has a promise, keeping God. Because He can look and say, you're not going to die before my Messiah is here. And know that Simeon is going to stay alive long enough to see him. For us as Christians, that gives us great hope. It strengthens our faith. It focuses our attention on Christ. But how does it do that? One of my favorite theologians, John MacArthur, provides an answer. It says, understanding Bible prophecy encourages and encourages us in two ways. First, it serves as a reminder that God controls history. When you read from the pages of Scripture how He keeps His promises, your faith is strengthened. By reflecting on the fulfilled promises of the past, you can find great comfort as you look forward to the future. Second, Understanding God's promises for the future provides a solid foundation to which you can anchor your hope. A sturdy shield with which you can deflect your doubts and fears about tomorrow. When you reflect on God's plans and promises for you and the world, you can face the future without fear. Christmas gets made into... This time where we celebrate Christmas trees and Christmas lights and Christmas cars and Christmas presents and Christmas parties and ugly sweaters and everything else. And none of that is a place to anchor your hope. Because after Christmas, what happens to the tree? You take it down. What happens to the ugly sweaters? They get stuck in the back of the closet for next year. What happens to all the Christmas cards? If you keep them, you put them in something and you stick them in the closet. Or you may not keep them. But the fact that God promised a man that you're not going to die until you see your Messiah. And he sees him. And the fact that God is a promise-keeping God gives us a place to anchor our hope because He never changes. Because He can make a promise and know for certain in our hearts He will keep it because that's what He does. So as Christmas season comes and goes, and as we kind of touched on in our Sunday school lesson this morning, as the joy of Christmas comes and goes with you putting up the tree and you taking down the tree. Our true joy is anchored in the fact that He will do what He said He will do. Amen. That He who said, I will send the Savior, sent the Savior. But the one who said, I will forgive you every sin you've ever committed. Proved it by dying on a cross, staying in a tomb for three days, and then coming out of the tomb, never to die again. That the God who promised, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, did something that no other person can do. He placed his own spirit within us as his children, so he always walks with us. Amen. So he does never. Leave us. We carry Him with us. Christmas is not about the gifts under the tree. 
It's about the gift He has given us. Just as He promised. So many prophecies in the Old Testament were fulfilled at the birth of Christ. Some scholars say hundreds. These prophecies were promises of what was going to happen. And they happened. So my question to you is, what promises has God made to you and the pages of Scripture you need to reflect on and use as an anchor for your hope? Especially in a time where the news is quite frankly depressing. At a time where people are suffering. What promises in Scripture do you need to anchor your hope to? That's for you to answer. For Simeon, it was the fact that God would send his Messiah and he was going to see them. So God is a promise-keeping God. We also see that he is a God who saves. Now I want to take this next section kind of verse by verse. Starting in verse 30, as Simeon sings out this praise to the Lord, he says in verse 30, For my eyes have seen your salvation. He was a student of the Old Testament. He knew the prophecies of the Messiah. He knew the Messiah when he came would be the Savior of his people. I have seen your salvation. I have seen who you have promised to send. And I think when he saw the baby Jesus, he didn't know what his name was in, but under the influence of the Spirit of God, he knew who this child was and what he was going to do. He knew what lay ahead for this child. He knew that this beautiful baby had been born to die. And that his death would bring salvation for all who believe. Verse 31, you have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. Now I gotta ask you a question. I know I'm full of questions this morning. What does it mean? What does it mean? <coughs> Hebrews chapter ten. Starting in verse one and going through verse six. I want you to listen. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the actual form of those realities, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered? Since the worshiper, once purified, would no longer have any consciousness of sin, but in the sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, as he was coming into the world, he said, you did not want sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. It, when Simeon says, you have prepared it, he understood that this child was born to be a sacrifice. That all the, the sacrifices offered in the old sacrificial system were insufficient to take away the sins of those who offered sacrifice. So he knew that God sent the perfect sacrifice. He sent his Messiah who would save his people from their sins. 
because of what was wanted was sacrifice made by someone who was perfect in obedience to the will of God. Verse 32, he says, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Now, in Romans eleven twenty-five, 25, Paul says that this light to the Gentiles and glory to Israel was a mystery. It was something that had not been previously understood or revealed by God but was still true and part of his eternal plan of salvation what, J what Simeon is saying about this baby Jesus is that you came not just for the people who say they're Israel you came for everybody you came to be a light of revelation for the Gentiles that you don't have to become a Jew to be saved and be right with God you had to place your faith in this child the Messiah through faith in Him, you would be redeemed. And glory to His people Israel because they were given all the promises. They were given all the prophecies. And God answered all of them. I told you who the Messiah was. I told you where He was going to be born. I told you how He was going to be born. I told you what He was coming for. It's to your glory because I gave all of this to you. You see, Simeon, as he's praising God and holding up Christ, proclaims that what Jesus will later say about himself, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. This child, this this promised Messiah was the only way we were going to get to heaven. That it wasn't about keeping laws and keeping ordinances and following rituals. It was about faith in Him and nothing else. And the fact that God saved sinners was not going to be secret knowledge that only a few would know. He proclaimed it in the temple for everyone to hear. Think about it. That's the great storyline of Christmas. That Jesus Christ, the eternal second person of the Trinity, left heaven and came to earth to be a perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind. That even though he was fully man, he was fully God and he was capable of forgiving sin. The manger that held the newborn baby boy while he himself held the universe together. That while he was dependent on his mother for care and protection, everything that existed depended on him to continue existing. And that God came to man so man could come to God. That God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the storyline of Christmas. He has promised. He has kept his promise. And he saved all who come to him in faith. Trusting in what this child was born to do. And what this child did. People all around the world saw Celebrate a holiday. They don't even know what they're celebrating. Uh, I read a recent article where uh, people in a state on the left coast were asked what Christmas was about. I said it's about giving gifts and celebrating family and friends. They don't even know what they're celebrating. 
They don't even know why they're celebrating. But as followers of Christ, we know what Christmas is about. We celebrate the birth of our Messiah. That God himself invaded human history in order to carry out his perfect plan of salvation. At Easter, we tend to focus on the cross. Good Friday and the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, and those are all important, but at Christmas, we must also focus on the cross because Jesus came so he could end up at the cross. And it was the same Jesus that was laying in the manger that was circumcised on the eighth day that perfectly obeyed the law of God. He was the one that had no sin. He became sin for us. So that he could pay the full penalty on the cross for our sake. Christmas is a time of giving gifts and spending time with loved ones, yes. More importantly, it's to celebrate that salvation has come to all mankind. It's not just about trees. It's not just about any of those things. It's that salvation has come for everyone. Because God made a promise He would send His Messiah. That He would save His people from their sins. And He kept that promise. And that salvation is free to all who will accept it. Corey Ten Boom said, Who can add to Christmas? The perfect motive is that God so loved the world. The perfect gift is that He gave His only Son. The only requirement is to believe in Him. The reward of faith is that you shall have everlasting life. What can we add to that? J.I. Packer said that the Christian message is that there is a hope for ruined humanity. 